Welcome, everybody. Welcome to a special chat with a star in the food world, Deepa Thomas. How about an applause yeah. here? Let's hear it. Come on, Google people. Thank you. Deepa Thomas, this is her cookbook, Deepa Secrets. And today, here at the 188 Embarcadero campus, you are sampling her cuisine. So thank you. Oh, right here. The chef's right here. Thank Indeed. you for making it. So I'm Jan Yonahiro, and I'm a longtime broadcaster in San Francisco, and I have the honor of interviewing the star, Deepa Thomas. And here's what we'd like to do. Um, I've prepared some questions, mm -hmm. Deepa, thank you very much. We've got the book, we've got slides going on, we've got a studio audience. I will open it up for a Q&A from the studio audience, and we will adjourn, because I know this is lunch hour, we're gonna adjourn by one o'clock. So is that, is that, everybody good with that plan? Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Thank you for making time. Okay, first question, love the book, and I hope all of you get a copy of the book here and all Google campuses. It is a beautiful book, and I wanna say that every single photograph in this book, the food was cooked by Deepa, photographed by Deepa, and no artificial light. It's all natural lighting. So when you see pictures like this in the book, Mike, can you see this close up? I mean, it's <laughs> just stunning and beautiful. And she also wraps the book up with history, growing up in India, uh, meeting the most eligible man yeah. in yeah. India, and yeah. marrying him. <laughs> so here we go. Third printing, congratulations. Thank you. But looking back, you studied journalism and political science in India, came to the U.S., did a textile company, congratulations, and here you are now writing a book on Indian cuisine. What made the transfer from textiles to food? Deepa. Well, first of all, Jan Yanahiro people, how lucky am I oh. to have the Hall of Famer broadcaster herself, talking about my book, my first little experiment in cuisine. But to answer your question, you probably guessed it's not just the book in third print. I've been in third or fourth or fifth print because I think you have to show up and meet the opportunities as they appear and put one foot in front of the other and think about how you can make your talents useful to others. And this came about with... Uh, discovering that my husband was a type 2 diabetic. Of course, he, he looks like Omar Sharif, but that didn't mean he didn't have diabetes. Uh, and we didn't know how to manage this except with insulin shots, which he was on for 10 years. And when I finally retired from my business, I thought, well, what happens if I looked at food, Dina, food as art? And definitely we eat with our eyes first, right? You'd agree if you see it and it looks beautiful, you want to try it. So I thought, is there a way I could trick my husband, like a good wife, trick him <laughs> into eating healthy? Because if I told this rice bowl kid growing up in the south of India, rice was a staple, oh, you know what, I'm just going to take rice out. I'm going to take bread out. I'm going to take all the white carbs out he'd have gone shopping for another wife. So, <laughs> so I, had, <laughs> I had to trick him into it. And the rule I applied, for those of you who like to cook and understand, cooking in layers of flavor, you can bump up the flavor if you're taking something out. So if I took out a bad ingredient that causes sugar spikes and weight gain, like a refined carb, I would bump it up with an Indian gramolata or caramelized shallots at the end. And I like to think you can, you can redo and recover from any mistake in cooking, and I made my fair share of them, except burnt garlic, mm -hmm. because <laughs> then you just throw it out and start again. So, so uh, that, that was a start. Yes. And, and, and to be honest, in fact, with your cooking, you lost 20 pounds yes. yourself. Yes. Your husband lost weight. And in fact, he is off of insulin shots with Deepa's cooking <laughs> from this book. So let that be a lesson to all of us. Now, moving on, you know, it appears to me that Indian cuisine is having its moment here in the US. 
it's become very popular. We're all flocking to all the Indian restaurants. Why do you think that Indian food is now having its moment here in the U.S.? Mm. It's a great question. In fact, there was a story in the local papers about Indian food on the rise. And um, they actually asked me to say something, and I shot my mouth off, as is my want. And what I think is happening is borderless cuisine is probably what we need to focus on. Indian food has been very much an exotic cuisine for a lot of years. Now it's slowly moving into mainstream, like before it, Italian food did, or Chinese food. You know, I think this is the melting pot, not just of people from different parts of the world, but of techniques uh, and flavors. And when you can, you can blend the flavors without creating a flavor muddle, I'm not a big proponent of fusion cuisine, because you don't know what the heck it is. <laughs> but if you can have, like music, clear notes, even if it's borrowed from other cuisines. So Indian food is coming into the mainstream for that reason, maybe. It's always been the high flavor ticket, right? But now people are getting aware of its health benefits. Correct. Yeah. And the health benefits, do you think it comes from the spices and how, or how it's cooked, the ingredients? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really an irony that India, 3,000 years ago, knew that food is medicine, that when your diet is right, uh, medicine is of no need. And when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. This is 3,000 years ago, Ayurveda, India. Well then, how can India be the diabetic capital of the world? Isn't it interesting? Yes. So what happened is what we did to ingredients in the course of time from 3,000 years to now, we treated food in such a manner that it would stay stable on supermarket shelves and in warehouses. And in the process, we overly refined all the ingredients so as Michael Pollan says, eat food that your grandmother would recognize. She wouldn't recognize wheat today, for instance. Uh, and India knows, but they don't know how to handle modern industrialized ingredients. But it knows that all disease starts in the inflammation that begins in the gut. And all disease, not some disease, inclusive of type 2 diabetes, but not limited to it. So Indian ingredients from the seeds to the spices were really a focus of the old Ayurvedic practitioners on how to reduce inflammation while bumping up flavor. So that's really key. And what I'm trying to do is make everything old new again. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I invented uh, this way of cooking, but I'm shining a light on what is incredibly anti-inflammatory about Indian seeds and spices. And so even if you're cooking Italian food, throw some Indian spices, spices in. on it. Yeah. It's healthier. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you talk a lot about new Indian yes. cuisine. Tell the audience what you mean by the new Indian cuisine. Well, I'm an incurable brand geek. So I had to differentiate from Indian cuisine at large a new Indian cooking, so what is the difference? Uh, traditional Indian food, we all know, is flavorful and exciting and exotic. Spicy and yeah. curried. And, and exotic if you're not from India, I suppose. But it's also high in carbs, very high in refined carbs. It's uh, incredibly labor intensive. So you ask what new Indian cuisine is, it's exactly the opposite. It's less labor, higher flavor, healthier, lots of shortcuts. I call them secrets. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the positioning I'd like to take is, you know, it just shines a light on all that is potentially good about Indian cuisine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so popular. But in your, on your book, here's a cover, everybody. It says slow carb. You know, we hear about this, but I'm just going to ask for everybody in the audience and across the Google campuses, tell us Slow carbs, what is slow carb? What yeah. is it? Well, we can contrast it with uh, low carb. Low carb cuts carb across the board. Okay. That all carbs are bad is the approach in low carb. I don't believe that to be true. Um, I think taking the thesis what we do to a carb is what makes it bad. So refining it to uh, one inch of death 
is bad. And what, the whiter something is, I'm sorry, white people. <laughs> you know, you got to look at it again. But um, slow carb is closer to the grain itself, so complex grains that haven't been processed, that make the body work to be absorbed, higher fiber. And so the longer a food takes to be digested, the better it is for you as a simple principle. Okay. The quicker it is to be digested, like sugar itself, or white carbs, potatoes, rice, flour, it converts very quickly to sugar, and it, all foods convert to energy, sugar, energy, but when it's quickly converted, it is stored as fat. So that's the big difference between slow carb, you're really focusing on lower glycemic index of foods, that is how quickly or slowly a food converts to sugar. So whenever we, I talk to a chef, I always say, well, what's your background? Did your mother, your grandmother, some of your father cook? I see some people nodding their heads. I mean, but, but I've read Deepa's book, and she didn't cook as a young girl. And in fact, she learned to cook when she came here to the U.S., and in fact, she talks about how she burnt her first meal for her husband. Burnt it. They had <laughs> and to go get steak. Yeah, and he, they had to go get pizza. But let's talk a little bit about what did you learn growing up in India? And um, in fact, but one of your grandparents did milk cows. Yes. So, but you didn't grow up with you know going into the kitchen and learning everything and trying everything. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I thought everyone grew up with uh, kitchen stuff, which is another thing about Indian cooking. It's so high in labor because it was easy to have people help you in the kitchen. Well, when I came to Stanford campus as a young bride, I rang the bell and no one came. <laughs> so, good luck. Get up and do it yourself. So it was a necessity. And uh, when the kids were growing up, and Sunil will attest to this, if I got food on the table, it was considered a win. It didn't matter what it was, you know, just food on the table. Uh, but as we looked at how we were, you know, we were becoming successful, it's the immigrant dream. Tapi and I probably overshot the mark in all the hopes and dreams we had to be successful. But the price we paid was completely neglecting our own selves not thinking about nutrition or exercise or well-being. It was just survival. You've got to make it. There's no safety net under you. So if you're in that kind of a mindset, cooking becomes a burden. But if you start to pay attention to the one thing you have in life, which is your life, and you start to think about H-O-L-E's that never get filled with food, I think it took me, the, I'm a very slow learner, as you've probably guessed by now, but it took, me, <laughs> it took me the better part of half a century to really get that. So I had a very adversarial relationship with food, and I don't know how many people in this room will relate or across the campuses. But the fact is, food, if you're a woman, at least it was in my culture, oh, don't eat it, you'll get fat, right? Or this I'm, culture, too. Yeah, or I'm <laughs> depressed, I'm just going to have a bag of chips. Well, both ends don't work. And I talk about my own journey uh, with the HOLEs that never get, get filled with food. And then so you look at food as your nourishment for your spirit and body, uh, but not just for your body. And, and we've been talking about her husband and Thampi is here. And in fact, um, it was sort of an arranged marriage, sort of. Yeah. But he was considered the most eligible bachelor back in her home <laughs> state. And he was studying here at Stanford. And she thought, oh, well, I mean, her family said, oh, you've got to marry him. And you didn't quite have that idea. No. And I say this because she has helped have him get his health back. They have two children, two sons, and, and her son is here. He's one of the reasons why we are all here, because he works here at Google. Uh -huh. Yay, Sunil Sunil Thomas. Good. <laughs> so, you know, this is a family affair right here. Um, but so I just want to digress just a little bit about this and then just say, this is a reporter question. Both you and your husband are immigrants. Mm -hmm. So this is slightly off topic from food. But you both are immigrants. You've both become 
became huge successes here, raised your family here, your children. What do you feel about the immigrants in America today and what should happen? So this is a political question. Forgive no me. Dear. I'm a reporter. She's going off book. Yeah, off book, <laughs> but we'll come back to the book. Yes. So go, what do you think? Well, you know, one has to look at a personal journey and uh, times have changed. When Tampi and I came here, uh, I think Sunil will attest to this. When, by the time we had Sunil, he was the first Indian in all of the Portola Valley schools, which is unbelievable. You, you see him sitting there, he's not that old. He is rudely very old, but um, so things have changed. And, and uh, the, the understanding of ethnic difference, um, what has happened to the American economy and how the 1% is literally, uh, and we probably are in the 1%, so I can say this today, when we came here, we were making, uh, Tampi was making $300 a month uh, at assistantship at Stanford, doing his PhD. Uh, try living on 300 bucks. Well, I spent 50 bucks on a straw hat, <laughs> so that took care of the first month. Um, you know, we had to learn. But here we are, the minute we became successful, you have this need to hold that door open for others. So I, I, I don't know when you want to talk about this, Jan. I, I think I'd like to talk through Food Corps, the reason right. I got involved, this entire book and all of my royalty will go to a nonprofit called Food Corps. And why? Because, you know, my American friends who grew up being told to finish what's on their plate because there are kids starving in India, fall off their chairs when I tell them that one out of five kids in Ameri American schools is going to bed hungry and waking up hungry. It is just not okay. It's not a political thing. So when I met Kurt Ellis, that's a longer story, but he's written the foreword to my book. He was the founding C he is the founding CEO of Food Corps. Uh, I found a new hero. Uh, this young man came out of Yale and figured out how to uh, create a scalable nonprofit which goes into the schools and works with the schools, especially in underprivileged areas, to uh, to do something about the lunch programs and connect the kids to healthy food habits. So I think the immigrant story is one of desperately trying to succeed. And then some of us are fortunate enough, enough to make it and ask the question, how much is enough? How much money? How much food? And when you answer that question, you hold the door open for others. And if you want to get into all the politics of today, I think it's ridiculous. Um, but the fact is we're individual human beings, all aspiring to be successful. And I'd like to stay with that thought of uh, philanthropy and Im immigrants. It's a new story, I think, mm -hmm. because philanthropy was always part of the American history. But for immigrants, it's sort of a luxury to even think about it. And we might be on the first wave of it. So I'm proud of that. And we are too. I mean, so the proceeds from this book will go to Food Corps. My royalties. Her yeah. Yeah. deepest royalties. And, and for that, I think we need to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> say thank you. Thank you. So I do want to open it up for Q&A and leave a lot of time for that. And we've got Chef Dina here and her team. So, you know, I'm going to say, Dina, you're first up for the question. So let's give uh, Dina a microphone. And we want to ask everybody else to chime in, too. So Dina, thank you for preparing today's menu. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. What would you like to ask? Um, so Dina? I'm wondering what really Hope. brought you uh, What really brought you into uh, the idea of writing this book? What was your inspiration for really spreading That's it? That's a very good question, Dina. It took five years. And I tried to say, no, 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 it's not me. And, and this is not what I want to do. And to the first order, I wanted to document my recipes for my sons, because both of them like to cook. And it was really a, a dear friend of mine who is Susan Dreyfus, and she's in, in this book as a chapter. Susan is an award-winning, Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker, it turns out. But that aside, she and I served on the board of Rhode Island School of Design together, and we became good friends. And it was Susan who, in her kitchen, and she hates to cook, but she has a really beautiful kitchen in, in New York, 
She turned an imaginary lens onto me and said, what was your first memory with food? And out came tumbling my story of my grandmother, who's in, in this book. Um, and she said, freeze the frame. I said, I beg your pardon? And she said, write it the way you said it. Because if you connect your life stories and how improbable it was that you would write a cookbook, um, but if you write those stories, maybe the people who read it will not be intimidated by the recipes that, yes, I've simplified it, I've taken the labor out of it, I've tried to Americanize the understanding of the ingredients and process. Um, but it, the real impetus was what, it was so shocking that five days of an accidental turn in Tampi's life, my husband's life, where he forgot to take his insulin shot, which was grounds for panic in our household back in the day. But when he took his blood sugar, after five days of eating this way, his blood sugar was normal. So we, our last name is Thomas, so Doubting Thomases, ran off to Wal Walgreens and got another monitor, and it remained normal. So then I told my general physician, who was the associate dean of UCSF, and he said, Mrs. Thomas, you better come in and tell us uh, what you're doing because there are 3 million Indians in America alone and 50% are diabetic. India is the diabetic capital of the world. One third of the adult population of America is fighting obesity or diabetes or both. It's related. So I felt, you know, if I was going to do this, then I was go this is going to be my gift. Uh, and now our other son just had he and his wife had our first grandchild. And so, of course, it is a gift to her, I hope, you know, that to, to dare to write the course. You know, there's, there's been so many challenges to, in life. We all have them. But how we overcome them. And did I think I'd write a cookbook? No. <laughs> but that it sold 10,000 copies in three months. They tell me is something good. <laughs> it is good. It's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Yeah, and, and we want to say that Th Thampi, her husband, is still off of insulin. Yes. Six years and counting. S six years and counting. And ever since she, he started to eat, because Deepa has secrets in this. <laughs> so, um, ladies, um, you're part of the uh, crew here that prepare healthy foods for all the Google employees. Questions from you. You want to pass the mic down? So I was actually curious about how different the cuisine in your book is from what I would consider modern or typical Indian food. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Great question. Deepa? Um, you know, it's, it's really uh, my commitment to art and flavor brought together. Now, traditional Indian food, I promised someone earlier, I wouldn't say risks being 50 shades of brown. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sorry, folks. Uh, paying attention to how it looks when it's plated is not the first thing you think about with Indian food. For me, it's essential. Uh, you know, my environment is important. It, it affects my well-being that there's a candle on the table. There's maybe some fresh flowers, even weeds. You know, the thoughtfulness, which really helped the healing that I had to go through um, in my American life, I found that no matter what difficulties I was facing, if I just made my environment a little tidier or prettier, or maybe it's just me, but you know, there's, there's a part that I, I actually write about, um, the things we can do to be a little more mindful. Go ahead. Make, a, first of all, which cookbook author gets to read? <laughs> but uh, I, I suggest no carb comfort foods. Make something more beautiful, a plate, a table, your nightstand, light candles in the bedroom, window at dawn, at the dinner table, in the bath, linger after a meal. And it, it's just a little, you might see it on, on page uh, 201, suggestions of how to bring up well-being. And this was my approach to uh, the whole of this book. And Indian food suffers sometimes. Uh, from lack of thoughtfulness. You know, the flavor is overwhelmingly either beautiful or spicy, and you eat it, and that's it. But to take the time to present an ancient cuisine that has health benefits and is beautiful. 
I mean, this was when Sherry Heck, the photographer in my kitchen, saw what I was putting out for one of the recipes. She said, stop, let me take a picture of that. So this, this was that shot. It was just, I put this nutmeg with the mace around it is from my husband's younger brother's backyard in Kerala. So I had just thrown it on the cutting board and we took a shot of it. It's that beautiful. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't we lead with that? Right. So it is beautiful. Maybe you can talk about some of the other spices on the book. Yeah. So the nutmeg. Well, and then if, we've got. If you start from the center out, uh, most of the spice wars were fought over this little creature called a clove. Which is? Is right in the middle, and it's that longish, uh, right there, right there. Okay. And then this is cardamom. So clove and cardamom and cinnamon were the lead reasons why trading with the south of India was so through all the ages. And we feel that even during the biblical times, St. Thomas came to the south of India. Our church that we belong to, Thampi and I, dates back to St. Thomas, who was martyred in Kerala, apparently. Um, so you go on with, I'd like to talk about, about this actual spice in the background. Yes, this is We right think here. curry powder is curry. an Indian spice blend. It is not. It is a signature blend that every housewife would make up in her kitchen. And every mix would be slightly different. And then the Brits happened in India. And so they created this thing called curry powder, which can be quite nauseating, I find, in the stores. And that's the other thing. If you have spices in your kitchen that have been there for more than six months, throw it out. Uh, I had stuff when we moved from years, and I thought, oh my god. So all the nutritional value is gone. It smells and tastes like sawdust. It is important to keep whole spices. So that, that spice there is powdered. And of course, it includes turmeric, which gives it the yellow. Mm -hmm. um, but it would have coriander seeds, cumin seeds, anise seed, fennel seed. And if you kept seeds in your kitchen, you can toast them up and grind them. And that is much better way to go than have ground spices. And I give you recipes for my curry uh, blend and also deeper secret spice, which someday I hope to productize. Because uh, <laughs> then I can help more kids. But um, it's 16 different spices toasted and ground up, and a pinch of it will make your omelet taste one way, and uh, three tablespoons of it will take your roast another way. The recipe's in the book as well. So does that answer your question? Yes. And do we have another question here? Sure. You, you also <laughs> uh, work in food service here. So tell us your oh. question. So you had so much success with your book. What's next for Deepa Thomas? All right, oh, good wow. question. <laughs> Tell me your name. Jusenia. Jusenia, what a beautiful name. Yes. Thank you. Um, that's a great question, Jusenia. I think you and I have to have coffee someday and mm -hmm. talk about it some I would more. Love to. <laughs> you know, every day is an opportunity. And just having become a grandmother, I'm besought you know, by, with this little <laughs> creature that uh, something will happen in this journey that is taking another turn yet. Uh, I never thought a grandchild could change how I view life. It is completely different. Every window that was closed in my spirit has been blown open. Mm. So now the possibilities are endless. I think the universe is abundant. And I was saying earlier, if you, I find if I leave my hands open, as in my mind, incredible opportunity comes my way. So I'd love to do a line of products that makes it easier for the home chef. Um, and that too, hopefully then the sales of that will help us do even more good work. And I think my cause will always be child related. It is unconscionable, as I said, that our children are required to suffer in a country that throws away 40% of its food. You know, I think we all should be obsessed with this. Mm -hmm. So something we've talked about is like the disconnect between where food comes from and how it's produced and what we actually consume. And growing up, having servants prepare for you, and then in the United States, maybe having a fast food when you're young. How did your 
thinking and reaction to food change once you start preparing it for yourself and understanding recipes? Oh wow, that's a great that's good question. But we should, uh, if you read the book, and I have, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna admit this for, for Deepa. Oh, they came to, she came to the US and, and they did order pizza and yes, Kentucky yes, Fried yes, Chicken yes, yes. and all those things. And, but, and she actually learned to cook here in right. the USA. So, you know, there, there, yeah. there's a lead in. There is, and I think your question is how do I view it now uh, that I'm more conscious about how I shop, what I keep in the fridge, what I have in my pantry, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to that. From my own knowledge um, of if you come home tired, I can't imagine you guys going home and deciding to cook for yourself. Uh, it was a big challenge for me when the kids were young and I was running my own business. Now, therefore, I've given a cheat list of things to keep on hand so you can whip up a meal, even if you don't go grocery shopping. Uh, so that's the first thing, to get a little bit organized. And I love and I'm obsessed with farmer's markets. So whenever I get a chance on a Saturday, go down to the ferry building and you know, elbow out the chefs who are also shopping. <laughs> Dina, maybe you. Yes. And so we, living in California, we have access to such incredible ingredients. Um, I've been known to go a bit crazy over specialty salts, but I, I collect things that catch my attention, a beautiful fruit vinegar. I know someday I'll use it in a salad dressing or in a marinade. So I'm looking at ingredients from a sustainable standpoint, you know, if, whether it is just the two of us eating or friends drop by, uh, or it's a big party suddenly, will I be able to whip it up without you know, going berserk, which is another thing. The more organized I am, the less crazy I get with guests, which I've been known to be extremely crazy. <laughs> but my you. whole theory is, if I can do this, anyone can do this. That's what I'm trying to do with this book. It isn't uh, a Michelin star chef who, where somebody wrote on the back of my book, he happens to be a Michelin star chef, but for me, I wanted to take the mystery out of everyday cooking. And by the way, if you're lucky enough to be invited, Justin, to her home, may I just say it's a real treat. <laughs> I was, we enjoyed a fabulous dinner. She had lamb chops and she had <laughs> eggplant with corn and wow. a fresh salad. I mean, it was, if you're lucky enough, anybody here, maybe we could do a drawing or something. <laughs> so thank you for your question. Um, questions on that end? Do you teach cooking classes? Do you teach? Or would you like to? As well, I barely uh, finished this thing. And uh, in fact, Jan's daughter, Jenna, who works with Food Network. Yeah. I mean, I'm really well connected, you can yeah. tell. <laughs> uh, so Jenna, who is adorable, she and I were talking about maybe doing a little uh, clips on as simple as how do you peel a mango? I mean, there's a mango salad here. Well, maybe somebody doesn't know how to peel a mango. A 30-second clip of that, and then eventually leading into, I don't think I'll do full-on uh, cooking lessons, um, but there's a way to draw in small groups who have specific questions, uh, or come to places like this and have a little, I don't know, prepare lunch session together and share ideas and knowledge. I'd love to do that kind of thing. And we also know, because there are a lot of millennials in this room, you all want very quick, yeah. short videos. You don't want to stay for the hour long no, documentary no. on no. You know, the history of spices. So that's <laughs> the idea that you know, it's going to be short clips and you can find it on YouTube and, and learn and, and, and do it really quickly. What would your advice be to someone who is someone intimidated um, by the complexities of Indian food, um, who doesn't have much time, who is, I'm not, I'm a little older than the millennial age, yeah. but you know, at the same time have, want to prepare dishes, meals quickly. Yes. Um, and you know, where would you start? How would you approach it if you've never cooked Indian yeah. food? Okay. Well, that's a terrific question. And then this is spot on because I, uh, I was that person. I didn't know how to cook. I scorched my first meal. And there weren't great teachers who could have taught me um, what I remembered of my grandmother and mother's cooking informed me. And I think I'd say uh, approach Indian food. Now, do you cook 
at our general? Cook. Yes. I Fabulous. Oh, good. Start there. Approach it with the comfort you have cooking the foods you know how to cook, because that's how I approached Indian cuisine. I brought in the techniques from other cuisines that I was familiar with, and uh, you can open up the earlier pages of the book uh, and look at the recipes. They're really the ABCs. Uh, I recommend very strongly, uh, especially with a focus to type 2 diabetes and just losing weight and keep being healthy, a protein breakfast. So I save, for instance, uh, a stir fry or a grilled vegetable from the previous night, and I break uh, an egg open in a pan with uh, onions under it, so it caramelizes as it's cooking, and then put it on top of the stirred vegetables. That's Indian food also. So now if you want to get into a little more complicated stuff, I've got, for instance, I think one of Sunil's favorite things, the New Indian cacciatore, the chicken dish, which is really reminiscent of the Italian technique. But there's just enough Indian flavor and twist to keep it familiar. So pick the recipes, I would say. Uh, and if you're not going to have this book, approach Indian food from your comfort level not what you don't know. I mean, throw in some spice. How bad can it be? Uh, toasting cumin seeds. If there's one thing people will try, toast the cumin seeds till it's got this nutty flavor and short of going black and burnt. So really a good cinnamon char on it. And then when it's cooled, powder it and sprinkle it on stuff. I mean, make up your own Indian recipes. I want to encourage people to go off book because I learned exactly the, the way you're asking the question. What is Indian food? Oh my God, where are the servants? <laughs> I'm ringing the bell. Okay. So All right, so let, let's pass it around. And um, Sunil, do you have a question for your mother? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I guess my question to you is like, I think it's so important to um, get people to have a new view on Indian food in the US. But I think it's also important for Indians in India to rediscover Indian food and have a pride in their food and not identify luxury and a big night out with crappy food. Yes. And do you have any plans around that? You know? That's a great question, Sunil. I, I can see you're creating work for me. <laughs> no, as a good son should. As a good son should. But that is a big challenge. At the moment, the book is only sold in the US and Canada. But of course, Amazon is everywhere. And so they are, it's amazing how much demand uh, has been created in India for this kind of cooking. Now, what you're talking about is a mindset, how we view comfort food. And what's the need for, com what do we call comfort food? The foods you're describing, it's after a long day, let's go have some drinks and eat rubbish is the way to mitigate the stress that we probably should have handled in a different way in the first place. I, I don't think it's just India, but it's all countries that are struggling with uh, stress of economic competition and the fear of loss, loss of a job, loss of um, well-being, whatever it is. I don't think any one person can change the ethos of a culture like India or America, or any country, but all of us together can ask a question of ourselves. How we, what are the tools we have to handle stress? Simple question. I had the worst, in fact, I didn't have any tools. Today I have a few more tools. And as I have more tools to handle stress, I pay more attention, I'm more mindful. So until uh, we, as ordinary citizens, get mindful, I don't think young brands or anyone else is going to stop selling to, it's like drugs. You know, why do people buy drugs? They think it'll make them feel better. Same thing, junk food and drugs are in the same area of the brain. Sugar is registered in exactly the same place in the brain that cocaine is processed. Now, we can go into neurology and talk about the power of uh, food, but I, I think it's an ongoing discussion, Sunil, and I, I, I'm getting into this process where there's a professor at Stanford who is addressing uh, diabetes in India, and he's just asked me to come over, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Anything well, to help. Yeah. Right, I can see books all over India, deepest books all over in India, and I think that people will discover 
the health for benefits and, and really use this? You know, I think of myself and I cook and I'm willing to try some of the dishes that you would have highlighted. But then I think back to my parents who still live in India and they're used to their style of cooking and mm -hmm. eating. Uh, I wonder if you have thoughts on how I can sort of introduce them to like thinking about food differently and sort of adapting to like this style of cooking. Now, which state, do, which, where are they in India? Uh, they're in Maharashtra. Okay. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> then that's good because Maharashtra has healthier food, I have to say, than several of the northern states. And, and the reason uh, I ask that is I don't think you can change their perspective until they feel a need to be healthier. Are they in good health? Uh, yeah, so far they're doing Okay, well, well then I wouldn't mess with it. <laughs> they, probably, <laughs> they probably don't need my book. But the attitudes change from if you're curious as to what foods cause inflammation. So say, say you meet somebody with arthritis. That's, that's inflammation, mm -hmm. and it's food-based. So you can go to a, a Western doctor and get medi medication, which will guaranteed make your... Uh, gut bacteria die. Um, so it's up to us to be curious and of all the places, Google, come on guys, you, you, just, you can get all the information you need on how foods affect inflammation and how, what are the foods that reduce inflammation. Just even having a discussion on how they feel. You know, it, fatigue is a form of inflammation. So I, I, I entered this arena through that standpoint. I'm one of the lucky human beings, uh, apparently in the 1% of my age group, 100 years old, uh, <laughs> who is on zero medication. Now that's something to be in a family with heart disease and diabetes that I come from. I think it has something to do with paying attention to what goes in my mouth. And I'm not a good, good you know, I do all the wrong things. But there's recovery to be had. You know, your body is dying to heal. It literally is dying to heal. So if you will help it, it will heal. If you can turn to a, two recipes in the book that you would say are your favorites, or maybe Thampi's favorite, or Sunil's favorite, what recipe would you say? So for all of you who would like to see the book and know, what, what page mm. would you say, turn to this page, this is my favorite dish, my favorite recipe, or Thampi's favorite, what would you say? Okay, first of all, it's like asking me to choose a I favorite know. child. child, I know. But and he's sitting right there because yeah. he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the one, how many eat fish or meat in this room? So, okay, and but there are a couple of vegetarians. Vihan is a vegetarian. Yes. Any other vegetarian? Yes. Oh, two, three. Three vegetarians, okay. okay. So, so um, let me start with, you yeah. gave me two. Right? Yes, two. Okay. Uh, perhaps my favorite vegetable, funny thing, is cabbage. And maybe because it was cooked so badly in India, cooked within one inch of death. Bihar is not in his right? name. And no. the in his, sink, in his I mean, head, rather. in the house and you could smell it. So I went on this tear to make it more, um, crunchy and salad-like and yet flavorful. So, so I would say hot and crispy cabbage on page 150. Okay, so we are going to turn to 150. Gosh, you're, you're really going to do this. Absolutely. <laughs> Here we go, really yes. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is, yes. Okay, so the vegetarians in the room, three of you. This is your page, and by page the way, 150. What's up on top? is yet another recipe, spicy peanuts, which uh, is one of Sunil's favorites um, as a snack. And it's the kind of snack I keep on hand at, at home so that we are eating smaller meals, uh, four to five meals, not three large ones or two gigantic ones. And if you get hungry, a quarter cup of these spicy peanuts or the go nuts um, will absolutely curb the uh, hunger pang. And it's amazing. I like to say that the stomach is not behind the belly button, folks. It's a little higher. <laughs> <laughs> so you get full really easily. And paying attention to how much food is going into this, this is the size of a stomach, the fist. It should be. It should remain that way. But as we get older, it's not. 
So, uh, yes, I would say that's one of the okay. favorite recipes. And for the folks in the audience, they, they eat fish and meat. What would you say? Oh, my, <coughs> I'll have to pick the clay pot uh, fish. And that <coughs> is page 164. Okay. I and you don't need a clay pot for this, <laughs> mm -hmm. even though it's called clay pot. Uh, it's such a simple coconut sauce that if you can nail this one, which is very easy to make, then you might even throw in roasted vegetables into the coconut sauce. So it's very versatile. I, I encourage people to go off book because uh, these sauces and techniques, you can use whatever ingredients you want. There's a Mughalai sauce in the book, which Mughalai sauce typically is cream-based and very heavy, and you, you need a wheelbarrow to leave the restaurant. But this is made. I substituted coconut milk for the cream. Ooh. And you can keep it on hand in your fridge and come home and put anything into that thing. It'll make shoe le leather taste good. <laughs> so there are two tips from the book yeah. itself. So in closing, what would you like to say to this audience about Deepa's secret? What is the biggest secret mm. you have, number one? And what's the message you want to give to everybody here in this audience and to all the Google campuses? Well, first of all, a huge thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here and uh, to the wonderful culinary team that has prepared so many recipes yeah. for my give, book. Give it up for them. They work today. And so we, we're going to try some of that stuff. But, you know, it's, it's really uh, my request is to be mindful around food. Uh, it took me a great deal of time to really focus on what that means. And the more I stabilized my spirit, the better my cooking got. Funny thing. Mm. So does that make sense? I hope it does. And so I'm sure you'll all, you know, in your busy lives, figure out oasis. Make cooking a zen experience, not a frenetic uh, get food on the table exercise. If you're just using half an hour of your time to cook, put the music on, pour yourself a glass of wine, play some music, and get into the zone and have fun with it. So there you go, everybody. You. Deepa Thomas, Deepa Secrets. Again, I'm here because Deepa is donating her royalties to Food Corps, and I think that is important. So thank you all for Can coming. Can I tell a quick story, just two okay. seconds? Yes. How I met Jan. I was buying a card at Papyrus, and uh, the manager there had bought my book, and she texted me and said, would you sign it? I said, oh, I'm right next door. I'll just walk over and sign it. So I walk in, and she's a little excitable. So she started jumping up and down that I'd physically present. I started jumping up and down. <laughs> and we didn't know that there was somebody at the counter. And I looked over and said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, are you Jan Yana Hero? And she said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> me, it's me. And that was just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Can you imagine? And we've become like oh. soul sisters. Yes. And here she we've is supporting to, my her place journey. And, and she asked me to come and do this interview. From Jackie her. Spear, who yeah. she, you were interviewing right. two On days Monday, ago. Monday. Monday to this. Yeah. Am I so, lucky? Yes. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us. Um, I think there's some great secrets in this book that we can all learn from. Thank you for having us here at the Google campus. I was excited coming to Google. I'm bragging. I'm going to Google. I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to have lunch at Google. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Deepa, for creating this book. My pleasure. One more time, thank you to Deepa, everybody. Oh, thank you.